So um, thank you everyone for coming tonight. I'm Carolyn Rupkevian. I'm the executive director of the Bar Harbor Historical Society. And we welcome you tonight to learn about the summer embassies of Bar Harbor. And before I introduce our speaker, I want to acknowledge that while we are talking about nations and embassies tonight, we are in the homeland of Wabanaki nations. We extend our respect and our gratitude to Wabanaki peoples and their ancestors, and we recognize their rich histories and living cultures. I also want to let you know that if you are not a member of the museum, please consider joining. Benefits include free admission to the museum, advance notice of special programs, invitations to member-only events, and other benefits as well. So let me introduce our speaker. Uh, Dr. Christina Posnan is a scholar of American migration and foreign relations and is an assistant professor of history at the University of Maryland. From 2017 to 2019, she was editor of the Journal of Austrian American History. She's currently the managing editor of the Journal of Slavery and Data Preservation, the Journal of Enslaved.org. She is at work on a book, which she may tell you about later, and an interactive map of sites related to Mark Twain during the two years he lived in Vienna. We'll have time for questions at the end, so now I'm going to ask everybody to mute if you're not muted already, and let's welcome Christina to begin. Thank you. Thank you. How's the volume? It's All great. right, great. Let me share here and slide show. All right. One sec, my apologies. All right, here we go. Um, so foreign diplomatic seats in the United States stood naturally in Washington, DC, but the capital city's sweltering summer climate drove American politicians and foreign diplomats alike out of the city in the summer months. Tonight, we'll explore Bar Harbor as a summer headquarters for members of the diplomatic corps. We'll talk about the array of ambassadors and heads of legations who chose Mount Desert Island for their summer base of operations, but especially Austria-Hungary's envoy and later ambassador, Baron Ladislas Hengel Müller von Hengerbar. What we'll see today is that not only did Washingtonians matter to Bar Harbor, but also that Bar Harbor mattered to Washingtonians and the world. President Grover Cleveland established the president of an alternative cooler location for the White House in the summer. And this continued under President William McKinley in the 1890s and into the early 20th century. The vacation vagaries of the diplomatic folk is what one monthly DC magazine calls this phenomenon. Such removals of foreign legations and embassies were so ubiquitous, in fact, that the State Department's diplomatic list printed summer addresses along with regular ones. So here we see this article, Matters Diplomatic, that uh, shows the array of places that ambassadors were choosing to spend their summers away from the heat of Washington. We see that Bar Harbor specifically um, is portrayed in one of these photos. And then here we have- um, Excuse me, we, we aren't seeing any of the slides. Oh no. <clears throat> Thank you. Oh my. All right, let's try again. Now, do you see them? Yeah, we see your whole screen, yep. Yeah. So you should All right. Be well, Thank we're you. gonna, we'll deal with the whole screen then. There we go. Uh, so here we have this article, um, Matters Diplomatic, and we see that um, Bar Harbor specifically is pictured um, in the um, corner here. 
And then um, we have the diplomatic list that the State Department publishes every year. This one happens to be from 1923, um, and it lists the literal summer address, right, for certain locations because it is so consistent uh, that these legations remove to Bar Harbor for the summer. All right. It's easy to forget in our modern era of air conditioning that DC summers were literally unbearable, humid, buggy, swampy, and kind of pointless since congressional recesses meant that many representatives were home during those months anyway. Ambassadorial summer locations of choice were as wide ranging as the Virginia mountains, upstate New York, and the Jersey Shore, but New England was in the eyes of the majority of foreign governments, the quote, summer capital of the United States. And this is what Walden Fawcett reported for the New England Magazine in 1906. The Northeastern section of Uncle Sam's domain, as he called it, was favored owing to its more temperate summer climate. Before the rise of ambassadorial summer sojourns to New England, many had used the summer opportunity to go home. And in this case, it often meant back to Europe um, or to Latin America or whatever capitals um, they were from. But during the Spanish-American War of 1898, it had become so important for a diplomatic presence to remain in Washington that many abandoned the practice of sailing home for the summer and instead chose a different cooler location within the United States to spend that time instead. So according to Fawcett in this article, quote, no foreign power now takes the risk of allowing itself to be unrepresented in the United States during the summer. Although the summer ambassadorial residences were spread out between the Jersey and Massachusetts shores, the Berkshires, the New Hampshire lakes, and other spots, for a time in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, Mount Desert Island boasted the highest concentration. There has been some seasons when the quote summer embassies have been established at Newport and Narragansett Pier, Fawcett reported, but for the most part, envoys prefer to seek quieter havens like Maine, and leave the gay Rhode Island pleasure centers to the younger diplomats and the bachelors of the Corps. The Austrian ambassador and Baroness Engelmuller were, sources reported, um, among the most loyal in their devotion to Mount Desert Island. Engelmuller was not alone in this. The Russian envoy, Arthur Cassini, was very partial to Bar Harbor, alongside prominent capitalists, socialites, publishers, politicians, foreign embassy staff, educators, social reformers, and clergymen, from the Pulitzers to the Vanderbilts. Bar Harbor was so notable in its reputation as to be the setting for a scene in Richard Harding Davis's The Red Cross Girl, in which there's a passage in which the Turkish ambassador travels from Bar Harbor to Boston to receive secret correspondence. So this is so regular that it's even showing up in novels. Among the frequent summer residents, the staff and home governments could consistently expect the relocation of their American operations there each year, and the envoys could easily take up the summer's previous amusements and social diversions with little new planning. Christina? Yes. Um, some people are commenting in the chat that unless this is in slide mode, we really aren't seeing your images. Let's try slide mode again. Thank you. Does that, that thank, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Super. Um, so Bar Harbor was a popular destination for a rather wide set of European legations. Among the regulars on Mount Desert Island in the 15 or so years leading up to the First World War were the offices of Austria-Hungary, Russia, Portugal, Denmark, the Netherlands, Sweden, and Norway. In addition to Hengel Müller, Russia's Count Arthur Cassini, pictured here, Portugal's Jose Francisco de Horta, Denmark's Constantine Bruin, the Netherlands' um, John Loudon, 
and Sweden's Wilhelm August Ferdinand Eckengren were all serial long-term residents of Bar Harbor with their families as relevant and their staffs. Nearby, British Ambassador James Bryce operated for the season some years out of Northeast Harbor and other years out of Seal Harbor, quote, so near that Mr. and Mrs. Bryce will have plenty of opportunities to enter into the festivities of Bar Harbor society. In addition, the envoys of Turkey, Venezuela, Greece, and other legations visited briefly or took up residence once in a while as well. The, um, these six um, that I mentioned before were sort of the core that were there almost every year. The Bar Harbor record eagerly reported on these illustrious guests embracing the town's reputation as a fashionable watering hole, as it called it for diplomats. The paper boasted in 1911 that the, quote, gay resort will be increased by the presence of at least two embassies and the legations. In this time period, for a country to have an embassy in another's had to be sort of recognized as a great power, and the ones that were not were considered at the legation level rather than a full-blown embassy. This changes later on. Um, Hengel Muller, for his part, had begun his post in the United States as minister, but was upgraded to ambassador when the Austro-Hungarian legation officially became an embassy in 1902. A few days later, he was named a baron in Austria-Hungary, owing to his illustrious diplomatic posting. His ambassadorship made him the Dean of the Diplomatic Corps in 1910, a designation given to the longest serving foreign diplomat in the United States, which carried a great deal of social clout. The social press in Washington, New England, and throughout the country frequently reported on the Baron. His wife, the Baroness, sometimes referred to as Catherine in the American press other times as Marie, she is the same person but has many names, um, and their daughter Mila. Engel Miller operated um, out of the embassy in Washington during much of the winter, but spent months each year in Lenox, Massachusetts, and the summers almost invariably in Bar Harbor. The Washington Sunday Star identified the Baron and Baroness as among the most popular set in the social most popular of the social set there. When they missed one summer in Maine to return to Europe instead, their absence was considered newsworthy. They had been, quote, greatly missed. The Hengel Muller's presence in Maine offered prestige to the town and others in the orbit there, making their absence for a single season conspicuous. Although the Hengel Mullers were consistent in their choice of Bar Harbor, um, as their stemmering spot, they stayed at various pop properties. Initially, the Hengel Mullers just rented rooms at the Lyman Hotel, but in time, the main contingent of the Austro-Hungarian Embassy um, would relocate and operate out of a rented cottage. They rented the Bandbox, for example, in 1897, and most frequently, the Higgins Cottage, which they occupied in 1906, 1910, 1911, and probably other years as well. We don't have records for every single year. Um, Quote, the first arrivals are Baron and Baroness Hengelmuller and their little daughter. The Washington Post reported in 1910 who will be at the Higgins Cottage, the headquarters of the Austrian Embassy this summer. This was no mere vacation, but a literal base of diplomatic operations for Austria-Hungary as it was for other legations. At various times, the Portuguese legation took up residence at 7 Atlantic Avenue. Russia's occupied a cottage on Roberts Avenue. Denmark's legation could be found at the Clover Cottage and Sweden's the Cunningham Cottage or Conrad Cottage. Um, both um, of the- Maps showing at all? I don't, I'm sorry. Um, both Mr. Haig and Mr. Brune of the Scandinavian legations, for example, were bachelors and likely to be, quote, much sought at at the main resort. Um, the British embassy occupied Yee Haven in some years and other years upland to the southeast. 
Mount Desert Island served as a summer playground, of course, but serious work proceeded apace. Envoys were moved not only with their families, but also with their staffs, um, reporting that they brought no, um, numerous attaches. The transfer of embassies and legations to summer resorts did not result in any lull in work. Um, one article reported, voluminous correspondence is carried on constantly with the home governments beyond the seas and with the State Department in Washington. Indeed, Hengel Miller's correspondence from Bar Harbor was so expansive that examining many of his foreign ministry files is sitting all the way in Budapest um, from this period, you become just as accustomed to seeing the letters being signed from Bar Harbor or from Lenox, Massachusetts, as you do from Washington. From Hengel Miller's desk at Bar Harbor came correspondence on matters as varied as the aftermath of the 1898 Latimer massacre in Pennsylvania, in which several striking Austro-Hungarian coal miners had been killed, and return migration initiatives on which he authored a lengthy report. It suggests that the slower pace of life in Bar Harbor afforded him time to write in greater detail on American affairs to his superiors or in Vienna, which he and his staff had been collecting information on in the preceding months. In many of the volumes of the Foreign Relations of the United States, which publishes State Department correspondence, you can find hundreds of letters of the envoys of Austria-Hungary, Russia, Britain, Portugal, Denmark, the Netherlands, Sweden, Norway, and elsewhere sent from their summer headquarters in Bar Harbor in Mount Desert Island. So here's just a tiny sampling um, of over 221 results just for this short time frame um, in which the correspondence that made it into the Frust volumes, which isn't even all of it, um, is being signed from there. So we see that this isn't just a summer vacation spot, but a literal base of work. It's no exaggeration for the Bar Harbor record to report that, quote, with the Austrian and Russian embassies here for the summer, together with a number of lesser lights, Bar Harbor will be the diplomatic center this season. At times in June and July, it was among the most important diplomatic locations in the world. Leisure, of course, was no small part of the experience. The salubrious climate and social scene were paramount. The summer life of the diplomat is quite as interesting as their doings at the seat of government in winter, one reporter said. For one thing, there is less formality, and Americans who come in contact with them gain a much better idea of the personalities of these interesting foreigners. We get the sense that this really is an international um, community at that time. From the New York Times, the Washington Times, and the Bar Harbor Record, we can track how the Hengel Millers used their leisure time, from yacht parties to playing golf at the Kibo Valley Club. Baron Hengel Muller joined the ranks of cyclers, the record observed one day, and is becoming quite an expert in the art. The Times described the couple as enthusiastic pedestrians. Almost any fine morning, they can be seen on many, many of the beautiful walks around the island. The ambassadorial set more broadly also made enthusiastic use of the swimming club with Russia's A.N. Bobrov hosting a dinner there for the young set of envoys and legation staff and some of the ambassador's adult children. Dinner parties similarly afforded opportunities for diplomatic circles and other social elites to overlap after the day's work had ended. Often favored guests for dinner parties, the Hengel Mullers were also gracious hosts. Um, at the Trevio Villa in 1908, um, Mr. and Mrs. Winston Churchill even died with the Hengel Mullers alongside several prominent American families and Prince um, Vincent von Windischgratz um, as well. By 1911, the Venezuelan and Greek legations joined the summer crush from Washington to Maine, um, and Cassini's successor to the Russian post, Baron Rosen, likewise selected Bar Harbor as his summer base. 
In addition to these foreign diplomats taking up residence on Mount Desert Island, Bar Harbor also hosted American diplomats vacationing there over the summer, hosted by residing diplomats and other American elites alike. In 1913, Hengel Müller resigned his diplomatic post after decades of service to the Austro-Hungarian Foreign Ministry. Aging, he was less than thrilled with U.S. sentiment toward Germany preceding the outbreak of the Great War. He passed away in 1917 at the Adriatic resort town of Abazia, now Opatia, Ukraine, um, a place uh, you might see is not entirely unlike Bar Harbor. We see he has, you know, a type. Several regular legations continued in their summer residencies in Bar Harbor after the Hengel Müller's permanent return to Europe. Europe. Quote, wars and rumors of wars seem to have but little effect on the diplomats now at Bar Harbor in the vicinity, the Times reported in 1914, of whom four with their legation staff are again making their summer headquarters here. They have accepted invitations of usual and dined and danced as if there is no war at all. But the heyday of Mount Desert Island as the summer headquarters for a slew of embassies was waning. After the war, Bar Harbor continued to attract some ambassadorial visitors, but primarily for vacation rather than as a full-blown sea of summer operations. In 1924, um, Argentine ambassador and his family, for example, stayed for several weeks, but by and large, the legations of Portugal and Denmark only followed their pre-war routines of making Bar Harbor their base for the whole summer. Indeed, by the late 1920s, only a few foreign legations listed any summer address in the diplomatic list at all. It wasn't that they left Bar Harbor for other locations, but instead that shorter term travel rather than season long removal became the norm. Although the seasonal re relocation of governmental political elites from Washington ended by and large with the war, researchers should not be surprised to find heaps of diplomatic correspondence from mountain and beach resorts in the archives, including from Mount Desert Island. Scattered clues still exist um, to the island's past as this seat of the summer embassies and legations before World War I, even read on the website of Castle Main Cottage, for example, um, now a bed and breakfast, that they boast that the Baron and Baroness Hengel Müller were their most famous residents. All right. Apologies, I'm a fast talker, but I look forward to your questions. Feel free to uh unmute and uh, ask a question. And if everybody tries to ask it once, I'll try to moderate it a little bit more. Uh, Christina, you were, you mentioned the Higgins Cottage. Where, do you know exactly where that was in Bar Harbor? I have it somewhere. Chances are someone in this room knows a lot better than I do. I am the expert here on the diplomatic side of things, but you all have tremendous local knowledge that I am eager to learn from tonight as well. But let's see if I can find an answer for you while um, we um, take another question. What kind of security was necessary? Um, this is a great question, but um, one that we don't have a lot of answers on. This is sort of pre the um, kind of security age that we um, can think of for um, ambassadors afterwards. And so one of the articles um, that I referenced, for example, um, said that one of the really things that both the ambassadors and locals loved about this arrangement was that you could sort of rub elbows with each other, even if you came from sort of very different walks of life. There's still absolutely social stratification, right? This is not to say that this is uh, by any means um, an egalitarian um, opportunity, um, but that you can have um, 
a, an opportunity to sort of have dinner with ambassadors if you're elite enough of a local um, and that there isn't going to be the kind of gatekeeping that there would be in Washington. You sort of have a slight relaxing of the rules in this kind of summer location. Higgins Cottage is, uh, was on Holland Avenue near Mount Desert Street, no longer standing. Thank you. I have a question. Um, I had read that the, that the Baron was the Dean of the Diplomatic Corps for a number of years toward the end of his term. Uh, is that your understanding as well? Yes, he held that seat for a long time. Um, usually, uh, it was to a country's advantage to sort of keep the same ambassador in place for an extended period. This allowed you to build a lot more local connections with individuals in Congress. Um, as you became more senior, you sort of rose in the ranks. Um, and so Hengel Miller um, did hold this position um, of dean for a rather long time. Um, because um, he, uh, you know, quickly became the senior officer and ended up staying um, oh, uh, year after year after year. Uh, after he leaves, there's a really quick succession of followers. Um, one of the um, new ambassadors um, that they send either immediately after him or two after him actually gets kicked out of the United States um, during World War I because he um, is not handling um, rising tensions between Austria-Hungary and the United States well as things are moving toward the First World War. So Hengel Müller is really rare in this regard um, to be able to hold that dean seat for such a long time. Yeah. What does being Dean of the Diplomatic Corps entail? Yeah, so um, because you're the most senior member, it sort of uh, falls on you to be sort of the de facto host. So it's kind of, um, I don't know that it's very official of a position. I think that it means when there are formal events that your name is called first if they're sort of doing it in order of seniority, um, but that it sort of becomes your responsibility to sort of be the head host for things, especially when there is kind of an absence of volunteers. And so you're sort of expected to um, do camaraderie building events, host dinners, welcome new people um, to the scene, uh, and sort of uh, grease the political wheels through these kinds of uh, social uh, functions. Thank you. We've got a couple other questions in the chat there if you want to take a peek. Sure. There must have been political or romantic intrigue. Um, so uh, I mentioned, for example, um, Russian um, Count um, Arthur Cassini. Uh, he has a niece uh, who uh, at various times is recognized as his daughter. It is uh, unconclusive in the press whether he's his biological daughter or his niece um, who he perhaps has out of wedlock, calls his niece, is actually his daughter, later recognizes, etc. cetera. Um, I don't want to go on the record saying the wrong thing here, um, but she is extremely popular. Um, I mentioned some of the parties at the swimming club, for example. I believe she's invited to that. Um, and so uh, she definitely makes a splash um, in Washington, of course, um, but everywhere that she accompanies him. The Hengel Müller's daughter, um, Mila, she's younger, and so she doesn't have quite the kind of gossip column following her. Um, but um, others, um, I mentioned two of the really young Scandinavian um, envoys as well. Um, one of them sort of starts to come to Bar Harbor as a bachelor, but then later gets married, starts coming with his wife and child, and so they're popular as well, sort of the young family. And so uh, that's maybe not so much intrigue, but definitely like changing status where you have these um, guys going from being these very eligible bachelors in town with kind of um, foreign appeal, um, but then welcomed kind of as the more senior family man for like many years afterwards. 
And another interesting question I think you can see about did they employ or recruit local people? Yes. So many of the staff that they are bringing are sort of their permanent diplomatic staff. And so when they are hiring locals, it is less for diplomatic work, which is what their attaches are doing, and more for domestic work. Um, so this is um, sort of the social reality um, of that. So you will have some hiring of locals. Um, maybe in a few cases, typists I've seen where they can't get through all of their typing. And so they're maybe um, hiring locally for a little bit of typing assistance. There's also a lot of services that they'll hire for that aren't necessarily um, taking on staff, but making really extensive use of local postman delivery boys, um, telegraph, et cetera. And so those kinds of things they will hire for locally, but most of their like main diplomatic staff they're bringing with them. What, what are you going to uh, look for next? I mean, this sounds like kind of an ongoing project to keep learning about all these different ambassadors. Maybe. Um, I wear so many hats and I have to do so many different kinds of history right now. Um, my main job right now um, is uh, working to recover um, and connect the names of enslaved people. Um, and so this is something that I'm continuing to sort of do on the side. This is um, sort of the area of my dissertation. I wrote about sort of diplomatic relations between Austria-Hungary and the United States in the World War I era um, and sort of how migration and these kinds of questions about diplomatic um, history are intersecting. Um, so uh, this this is not something that I get to do in my day-to-day uh, -day work, but there is more to dig out there, especially since there's kind of that group of eight or nine countries that are very consistently um, putting their summer headquarters there. Um, it really blew my mind that in the diplomatic list, for example, year after year, Denmark, Portugal, there's just no question that they're going to come, right? Some of the other people... Um, are, you know, more bouncers, you know, they'll go to the Jersey Shore to Cape May one year, they'll go to the Berkshires one year, they'll go to uh, the Finger Lakes one year, um, but then others are like devoted, like Bar Harbor is where we go in the summer. I don't have to think about it. I don't have to like make new friends. I just go. Um, and so there is a lot more to discover there. Are there other people besides yourself? that you know of doing this work on other ambassadors perhaps or? Uh, on summer retreats, yeah. I don't yeah. know. Yeah. Um, I have not heard of anyone else digging into this specifically, but if I hear of anyone who is, I will be sure to let you all know. Okay. Yeah, so um, we have a question in the chat that do any of the family still retain property there? Um, that is not something that I found evidence for. We said, um, Teresa mentioned that um, Count Cassini had a camp on Eagle Lake, which I um, think I had, I don't know if I saw that in the documents, you might have found something that I didn't know about. Um, but uh, as far as ownership, I don't know that ownership ever um, was on the table. So on almost all of these cases, these are summer rentals um, that they have receipts for. Um, I think in many cases they're making arrangements kind of a year out um, to just book the same place, like the Higgins Cottage, um, where the Hengel Mullers go over and over again. Uh, but in other cases, um, someone else beats them to it. They have to switch one year because it's getting renovated. Um, I think sometimes that people want to be closer or further um, from the action in town. And so uh, there's some variety there, but um, I have not encountered anyone buying permanent um, a permanent abode there. Um, it would get really tricky if they had because during World War I, um, because of the Alien Property Act, all of the countries that become US enemies in the war, um, that property can be seized. So the Austro-Hungarian embassy, for example, um, uh, there's a consul von Neuber at that point, Alexander, 
at any of the property that he had acquired in the United States or was occupying was seized. Um, and then there's years and years of court battles after the war about this alien property. And so um, it was definitely a potential liability to accumulate property on US soil like that. All right, we have a question in the chat. Um, in general, were these ambassadors accepted in the high society or say, um, isolated and left alone, or were they talk of the town? The newspapers seem to suggest that they are the talk of the town. So that with the ambassadors coming, it sort of kicks off um, a you know, certain phase of the tourist season. Um, and that there seems to be pride from the um, Bar Harbor record, for example, in having uh, not only Washingtonians, um, but you know, some of these very um, long serving diplomats choose them as the location for the summer. So there doesn't seem to be a lot of like um, back channel griping. Um, everything in the press seems to be really positive. Um, and so uh, there doesn't seem to be any kind of uh, considering of them as foreign. Um, it's instead that they're, you know, uh, alluring. And so uh, I think that that is a case in which people are on the same page about their presence being welcomed. Did Bar Harbor end its diplomatic retreat status after World War I? It definitely takes a huge hit, right? You have this disruption of the cycle in which people come every year. Um, Portugal and Denmark definitely come back. So they keep coming during the war. They keep coming after the war. Um, but it's not that Bar Harbor loses its status. It's that leaving DC for the whole summer loses its status. During World War I, stuff keeps happening over the summer. And so more and more people find that they can't leave Washington for the whole summer. And it sort of falls out of fashion to do so. Congressional sessions get a little longer um, and you're not gonna be leaving DC for the whole summer. And so much more continues to be happening there. And so people will go on shorter trips but they won't up and relocate the entire base of embassy operations for the summer in the way that they used to at that era ends with the war largely, except for Portugal and Denmark who hold out. <laughs> um, and so it's not like they go anywhere else. It's just that that practice um, erodes. In the diplomatic list, you hardly find any summer addresses anymore after World War I. It's just not as much of a thing. Was, there, was there any sense of um, competition among potential properties for uh, housing the summer embassies? That is entirely possible. It's something I really expected to find correspondence on, but I did not find letters for. So I don't know if that's something where they're relegating it to uh, someone else to sort of book for them and that's not, you know, in the ambassador's own hand. So that file wasn't retained. I really thought I was gonna find, you know, oh, well, you know, the band box is booked this year, where should we go instead? But it's just not in there um, in the paperwork. So if I find anything like that, um, I'll be sure to forward it, but I did not find documents that speak to that kind of competition. The newspaper reports on it. And so if you scan through the Bar Harbor record, you'll have, for example, a list of who's renting what cottage that year, not only ambassadors and envoys, but um, New Yorkers, for example, as well. Um, but you don't get sort of the back talk about the angling for booking process. It's got to be there. Um, but the paperwork uh, hasn't made it to my eyes. Another question, did they attend church in Bar Harbor? I did not find evidence of them attending church. It doesn't mean that they didn't, but I did not find evidence that they did. 
um, did they separate one subsection of the diplomatic group from another? This is definitely an evolving story. The Hengel Millers come to Bar Harbor for so long that their social set does change. Um, in the beginning, for example, Count Cassini from um, the um, Russian legation is uh, embassy is there. Um, later, he retires. His successor chooses the same location, but it's not quite the same social circle and age group the whole time. So there's you know some consistency of people that they see on the regular, and then there's other cases in which it's evolving. And so um, uh, there doesn't seem to be any sort of clear clicks, um, but. Uh, also no kind of like famous animosities. When you're doing your research, are you, are you using digital copies of the newspapers or do you go to the original? Newspapers, yes to digital, especially because we've been in the pandemic for so long um, and uh, we have had less opportunity to do research. I happen to live right now in northern New Mexico, so I work for the University of Maryland, but remotely, so I am far away from both Washington and Maine, um, so I am relying on the fabulous digital newspaper collection. When it comes to the diplomatic correspondence, that's another story. So um, at the National Archives and Records Administration, um, the Austro-Hungarian foreign correspondence is mostly accessible on microfilm. They don't let you pull the paper boxes unless you have a reason to look at the paper files. Um, those actually recently got digitized. So now you can even from your own computer read the Austro-Hungarian foreign correspondence related to the United States. Um, it's T-157, I think, um, organized by Microfilm Reel. So you can find those yourself. But I've also um, spent a lot of time in the archives in both Vienna and Budapest. And so there it's reports that Hengel Müller wrote in Maine and mailed back to Europe and are now sitting in these foreign archives. And that's kind of neat, right, to have these papers that have traveled um, from Maine to these European archives. We forget how much information you can find about the United States in foreign archives because of these diplomatic holdings. So there's boxes and boxes with like a thick layer of dust that you can like draw a line through with your finger. Um, but yeah, this piece of paper, it's signed Hengel Müller Bar Harbor. And so um, you definitely have um, all of these, um, equivalent foreign ministry people um, in Budapest and Vienna receiving mountains of correspondence from Maine. We have a great question. Um, is there any evidence that US politicians traveled to Bar Harbor specifically to meet with any of the ambassadors? There is absolutely evidence that they were there as well and went to dinners together. It, I have never found a piece of paper that says they went there specifically to meet with them, but that doesn't mean it didn't happen. Um, so it's entirely possible that um, they go to talk about something in person, um, but they're definitely overlapping there. Um, lots of the um, U.S. politicians um, are going there for part of the summer as well. Um, and in some cases, it's very social, right? They, they're they friends in Washington. They go to dinners together in Washington or to political functions, um, and they want to continue that um, over the summer um, in Maine. A lot of times, they're kind of visiting each other at whatever summering spots they're choosing. So there are people who are picking Bar Harbor for the summer, but going down to Newport for a weekend because uh, ex-American politician is there for the summer and invites them down. Um, so that's definitely happening. Um, but it never says that they're going there specifically to see them for a political reason. All right, we have another question of whether I found any historic or well-known diplomatic correspondence that would be familiar that happened on MDI. So um, 
there isn't necessarily like a treaty, right, that I know of that was drafted um, there. It would be so fun to be able to share that with you. Um, but you do have tons and tons of reports. Um, and maybe reports don't sound exciting. Um, but one of the things that you really notice um, from Hengel Muller's um, reports back to um, his colleagues in Europe is that he's writing a lot of the long reports over the summers at Bar Harbor. He's kind of collecting bits of evidence in Washington. He seems to be more busy with kind of like the day-to-day -day functioning of the embassy. But when he's in Bar Harbor, that's when he like really writes his like long research papers um, where he maybe isn't having his door knocked on every five minutes um, and can get some more sustained writing time in. So a lot of the like beefiest, longest reports um, are coming then. And these are important documents that are really driving a lot of big foreign policy decisions. For example, what kinds of out migration laws are you going to have in Austria-Hungary, for example? Um, and um, the Latimer massacre that I mentioned, he's dealing with that um, almost entirely um, from Maine. This is a really big international incident to have striking minors um, get killed. And there's a lot of uh, diplomatic finessing that has to happen to prevent that from becoming a problem. And that is, I think, probably the biggest thing, um, sort of the biggest event um, in U.S. history that he's dealing with from Bar Harbor. So um, if you read any of the many books about the Latimer massacre, um, almost all the footnotes are going to be reports that Hengel Muller writes from Maine because um, that's a really important incident for his career. Uh, you, you mentioned uh, Winston Churchill, and I take from the time period, that's when he was a naval officer. Uh, long before being prime minister. Can you tell us a little more about the context of that? I so wish I could. It is one line in the newspaper. That's all we get. Um, he, you know, doesn't have that reputation that he'll develop later on. So all it says is that he's there at dinner. Rats, I know. I wanted to find so much more there, but... Uh, you know, we take the one line that the newspaper gives us. If perhaps um, if someone can, you know, go and connect to Winston Churchill's papers, maybe he writes about it in his day book or something. I should make a note for that just in case. Um, but, you know, from uh, everything I saw so far, it's just that one line. So tantalizing, right? We want photos. We want um, what they talked about, but that's not what we're getting. A, a lot of great books began, began with a single line, so keep at it. <laughs> Any other questions before we wrap up? for tonight. A comment, um, uh, Christina, if you haven't seen it already, there is at the Bar Harbor Historical Society a wonderful photograph of the, the castle main house right after it was built. And I think it has the Helgen Mueller family on pictures on the porch. Oh, that's awesome. That is not one of the pictures I have seen online anywhere. If someone wants to scan that and put it on the Wikimedia Commons with permission, I bet that would be like a gift to the pictorial world. Um, that would be really lot, exciting. It, it looks a lot different than the building today. I'm sure it does, yeah. Um, there's not a ton of pictures of them. Um, you know, you'd expect perhaps a little bit more of a photographic record, um, but there are really not that many pictures available of the Hengel Mullers themselves even. And so um, one of the things that I will definitely continue to look for um, is photos. I really wanted to find a photo of them in Maine. Um, and you've now mentioned one. And so I'm really excited to see it. I'm moving to Connecticut in the spring. And so I will be much closer. And so I'll have to make it up. I have a question. Um, 
I'm just so curious because we're, we're calling from Washington, D.C., and I grew up in Bar Harbor. So I'm so curious as to the connection or where you got your interest to research the Bar Harbor side of this um, history, which I'm really enjoying. Thank you. Yeah. So the kind of spark came sitting in Budapest um, in the archives and seeing all of these reports being signed from Maine. And it was like, why on earth is all of this really important foreign ministry correspondence coming from Maine, uh, also a bunch from Lenox, Massachusetts? Um, I expected all of that to be coming from a Washington DC return address. And so uh, it just like, uh, I was on a Fulbright doing uh, research for my dissertation and just like report after report um, that's signed from Maine. And that's really where um, it, the kind of spark came from. What kind of expanded it is that there's this group called the Botsteber Institute for Austrian American Studies uh, that I used to work for. I used to edit their journal, uh, the Journal of Austrian American History, and they also have a blog. And so I wrote this first as a blog post for them. And so um, it was sort of what happens, um, you know, in the summer when you have um, this, you know, very prominent Austro-Hungarian figure sort of uh, out and about in the United States, not just, you know, kind of in the like diplomatic enclave of Washington, DC, um, and then was able to expand the uh, article for a forthcoming issue of tobacco. And so um, you'll be able to see it in expanded form with a full suite of footnotes there. But if anyone wants uh, a link to any of the sources that I used tonight, I'm happy to send them. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Christina, and thank you to our audience. We really enjoyed your talk, and uh, we hope you'll fill us in if you get more information. We'll stay in touch. For sure. And, uh, thank you to the audience. Please uh, stay tuned through our uh, mailings and our Facebook page about upcoming programs um, that are in the works. Um, we're not ready to announce them yet, but um, please stay tuned. So thank you and uh, I will see you all another time. And you're getting lots of compliments, Christina, in the chat. So <laughs> great job. Good night, everyone. <laughs>